Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Parashat Re'eh. Lucky enough to be back again here, broadcasting live, Lakewood, New Jersey, from the house of my Talmud, Gal. Hashem should give him the kochot to have one of the greatest Elzmans, this man Bezat Hashem in learning. Hashem should give him siyat Dishmaya to be zoche him and his wonderful wife, the Banim of Bnei Banim, Talmidei Chachamim, son-in-law's Talmidei Chachamim, should be a bayit male Torah, amen ken yiratzo. Tonight is also Le'ilu Nishmat, Reb Shalom Shachna, Ben Reb Avram, the great Reb Shalom Shachna, Shuto Yagen Alai. Let's start with Biracha Rabotai. We're coming towards Elul. We can use all the Birachot. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Shakol Nihia Bidvaro. There are so many special points that's discussed in this week's parasha. It's a tough one to think, where do you want to go this week? But then I said to myself, we're holding Shabbat Mivarchim. Which, by the way, Rabotai, I mentioned in the past, the Balatanya, he gives a haftacha, mamish, a promise, that anyone that completes the entire Tehillim on Shabbat Mivarchim, ho, 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 You'll see what type of month he's going to have. Now that's on any month. But this month, the month of Elul, I mean, if there was ever a month that we wanted to capitalize on really driving home a great month, a month that counts, a month that's mitaken, all the other 12 months of the year, if there was ever a month that we wanted to have a great month, I think Elul would be the prime place to put all the kohot. And if that's the case... B'schut Reb Shalom Shachna Ben Abraham tonight. Beretta of Tetishin and the Banklach. B'schut the great Balatanya this Shabbat Shabbat Mevarchim. Let's say the entire Tehillim, and then after that Et Ratzon, and then we're going to ask Borei Olam for what we need. And on that note, I want to talk to you tonight about how to create Et Ratzon. This is a special one. This week's parasha talks about the great mitzvah of tzedakah. Ki patoach tiftach et yadecha lo. When you open, open your hand. Don't just open it. Open it wide. Open your heart. More than your hand. Open your heart. Open your pocket. And give. 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 Give with an open hand. Vehavet abitenu. Everything that he's missing, not just a dollar bill, but give, give if you know that this guy is really in need. Don't stop with the dollar. Give to your heart can give. And you'll see from here the fantastic mitzvah, tzedakah, but the creation of an etratzo. Where do I get that from? There is a Gimaram Bab Batra. The Gemara over there in Daf Yud Amur Aleph, and we're going to come back to this Gemara yet again tonight. But the Gemara starts off. Says the Gemara, Amar Rebbe Ezer, Amar Rebbe Azar. Said the great Rebbe Azar, Yahiv Pruta. Give a Pruta. Give a coin, Le'ani, to the poor man for tzedakah. And then, Ve'hadar matzle. And then quickly go and pray. Meaning, give tzedakah and then go and pray. The giving of the tzedakah is that amazing mitzvah that creates etratzon. It kind of opens the heavens. It kind of opens the ears of Shamayim. It kind of gets God's attention. Kivyachol. And at that moment, you have a special etratzon. You can pray for your needs. Many Hasidim have this wonderful minhag that every tefillah, before they start to pray, they go over to Sedaka box, they put in a few pennies. Shachri, Mincha, Arbit, it doesn't matter when, because they're going to pray. So they want to kind of 
They want to open the uh, the highways of heaven. So they put in a few pennies tzedakah. They give a few dollars tzedakah. And then they go and pray. Why? Because of this Gemara. You're able to create an et ratzon. And it's kind of like a midah keneged midah. Where here you have someone who's requesting from you help. And you went and helped them. Now Hashem says, listen, you went and helped somebody. I, I got to help you. So it kind of creates this catch-22, this fantastic midah keneged midah. Where you went and took money and gave it to the Ani, you went and helped someone who requested help from you. Hashem says, the same way you helped him when he requested, I'm going to help you when you request. That moment, quickly, pray. Says the Gemara Rebbe Azar, Yaev Pruta La'ani, he would give money to tzedakah to a poor man, the Hadar Matzle. And then he would go right away and pray. What an etratzon. Dichtiv, like the Pasuk says, Ani besedek eheze panecha. I see the righteousness on your face. Now, I just played words on that Pasuk. Because really, the simple pshat of that Pasuk is understood a little bit differently. Ani besedek eheze panecha. I see the tzedek when I see your face. But tonight we're going to play that a little bit on words simply because Reb Chaim Vital taught us something from his Rebbe the Arizal. Something fantastic based on another pasuk. The pasuk says in Tehillim, Hod vehadar pa'ola v'sidkato omedet la'ad. Hod is the glory. Hod vehadar pa'ola. The acts, the actions of glory magnificent actions of glory and splendor are done. But the acts of righteousness or maybe the act of tzedakah or medet la'ad, those actions stay for a long time. What does this pasuk mean? Says Reb Chaim Vital in his works in Sha Ruach HaKodesh Amud Yudchet and I heard this from none other the Mayidid Nefesh, Rabbi Gladstein from Cedarhurst, Hashem should bless him and give him kochot to continue to do the great, great Harbatzat Torah that he does in Klal Yisrael. Rabbi Gladstein says, take a look at this Sharuach HaKodesh. Rabbi Chaim Vital writes over there that he heard from his Rebbe, the Arizal, that the Arizal says that when a person goes out and does a mitzvah, Every mitzvah in Torah corresponds to different letters of the otiot of the alphabet. Aleph bet, every letter corresponds to a different mitzvah. How that works, this is Kabbalah, I, don't, I can't profess to know. It's beyond the scope of my knowledge, beyond the scope of this share. But, said Reb Chaim Vital, his Rebbe, the Arizal, taught him how each letter corresponds to every different mitzvah in Torah. And when you go out and you do a mitzvah, suddenly this magnificent letter lights up on your forehead, corresponding to the mitzvah you just did. Now, on all mitzvah, when you do that mitzvah, the letter shines on your forehead for one day, the day that you did the mitzvah. However, says the Arizal, this sedaka mitzvah, or rather the mitzvah of sedaka. When a person goes and gives sedaka and does real sedaka, the letter that corresponds to the mitzvah of sedaka shines on your forehead all week, an entire week long, the only mitzvah, and that's the way they explain the pasuk. Hod v'hadar pa'ala, you do incredible, glorious things, many beautiful mitzvot, and it'll stand for you for the day that you've done it. However, mitzvakato, when it comes to sedaka. Omedet la'ad, that sticks around much longer. Omedet la'ad, you might even say forever. But he said no, he said it stays much longer. It stays all week. An entire Shavua, you have this letter lit up on your forehead, demonstrating the beautiful tzedakah that you just gave. Well, that, that's a, such a, a beautiful idea brought by the, the Arizal. It's interesting, we have to figure out exactly how that works. 
like the Migadim uh, Chadashim asks, he says, you know, there's 248 mitzvot, and there's only 22 letters. <laughs> so how, how exactly do the 22 letters? But obviously I'm assuming that certain mitzvot have combinations. I would assume maybe of two, uh, some mitzvot, you know, the Migadim Chadashim brings from other svarim that the Arizal uh, sometimes said that he saw letters upside down on the forehead of people and that kind of gave him an understanding that they were lacking in those certain mitzvot. So these combinations beyond the scope of this year. You know, this isn't, a, I, uh, we, you know, uh, the, the Kabbalistic side of things. Hashem should bless those who do know it. I'm not one. So we're going to leave it at that. But the idea is an incredible idea. That mamash, your forehead shines with the mitzvah tzedakah all week. Whereas by regular mitzvot, only the day you did it. That's, that's amazing. It's interesting, if you want to just hear on this subject something interesting. The Ismach Moshe, he brings that this is the pshat, a simple pshat, that when it comes to the mitzvah of Shabbat, Shabbat's called an ot. But now you understand better what that means. Ot hi beniu benechem. This is a, a letter. When you keep Shabbat, the day of Shabbat, there is a letter, ot. You know, we always thought ot meant a sign, right? It's a sign between me and you. It's a sign of testimony. It's a sign of, sign of Klal Yisrael, Borei Olam. There's a sign between us. Tefillin is an ot. That's why we don't wear tefillin on Shabbat. Because tefillin's an ot and Shabbat's an ot. Ve'en ot ala ot. Beautiful. But now we have a new pshat. And what does that mean? What does it mean tefillin is an ot? What does it mean Shabbat is an ot? Torah tells us, ot hi beni u benechem. But now you know what it means. It's literally an ot. It's a letter. When you do the mitzvah, there's a letter that shines on your forehead. And I guess when you go in front of the great tzaddikim, the ones that have those magnificent eyes that are able to see from one side of the world to the next, the great tzaddikim of Klal Yisrael. That's why the rabbis are called the Ene Ha'am. They're called the eyes of the people, the eyes of the generation, because they can see what we can't see. I would assume one of the things that they can see that we can't see, not, not just the foresight that they have in Chochmah, but they can actually see what we can't see. And over here, you understand, someone can walk into a tzaddik, and Ramchayim Kanievsky can look at him, so, ooh! Yeah, I was told it was because of the Malachim that walk in with you, right? The guy just did a mitzvah. The Malachim, they come and they escort the person for a certain amount of time. But over here, the Arisal says more. He says, on the forehead of the guy itself, you're able to see a letter that corresponds to the mitzvot he just did. And sometimes he writes his multiple letters. And each letter shines one at a time to highlight each mitzvah the guy did that day. So his head could look like a matrix of letters, of all different types of letters. Mamash, the person shining. But that's for one day. Oti beniu benechem, Shabbat, it's an ot, it's an actual letter, one day. Tefillin's an ot, one day, the day you did it. Tzedakah, v'tzedkato, omedet, la'ad. Tzedakah, the ot, says the Arizal, it actually stays all week. Wow, that's amazing. I always thought to myself, maybe that's the pshat, why tzedakah's tatzil mimavet. I thought to myself that maybe if a person goes and gives tzedakah, so all week long his face shines from this mitzvah, maybe that's like a certain something that protects him. It's a shmira because, you know, osek be mitzvah, patum in mitzvah. But then at the same time, kola osek be mitzvah enam nizakim, right? Someone who's osek mitzvah is enam nizakim. So it's amazing. Nezek doesn't come to you when you're osek in a mitzvah. Now, typical mitzvah lasts for one day. But the tzedakah mitzvah lasts all week. And it shines as if the guy was osek in the mitzvah because the mitzvah shines on him all week. And therefore, all week, the malchamavet comes to this guy and he can't touch him because his face is shining as if he's osek in the mitzvah. And calls man that he's ose mitzvah, ose mitzvah, and on zakin, I can't touch him. That was just a shot that we were thinking out there out loud. Yeah, the ani maybe, bemet, you know, because he's nizon, uh, maybe. 
But again, these are the beauties of the mitzvah siddaka, the highlight of this week's parasha, where there is something special about this mitzvah that actually lights up a person, omedet la'at. Unlike the regular mitzvah one day, this all week. Wow. Unbelievable. And now that we spoke about what the mitzvah does and how tzedakah creates an etratzon, and I would like to say that if it lights on your forehead all week, maybe it's an etratzon all week. Maybe that gives you a special week of tefillot, not just that moment, but it sticks with you and it stays with you and it gives you a good week, so to speak. A good week. A good week of etratzon, a good week of tefillot. It's amazing what one mitzvah can do. Such a special mitzvah. Patoach tiftach. That's why the Torah is stressing this mitzvah. Patoach tiftach. Don't, don't, don't be cheap. Go all the way with this one because this one will take care of you better than you're taking care of him. It'll do more for you than you're doing for him. And therefore the Torah stress, you know, we don't find by other mitzvot that the Torah stresses the point of doing that mitzvah as don't hold back. Torah tells you by lulav and etrov, shake. That's it. Doesn't tell you much else. Just lakachtem lachem. By yom anishon, priyets adar. Do the mitzvah. All of a sudden by tzedakah, it's like the Torah is, is pleading with the guy. Not just patoach. Patoach tiftach. Ha'abe ta'abitenu. Right? It's always double lashon. Ha'anek ta'anek. Says the Rambam, all these mitzvot on the mitzvot of Siddaka, and they're always mentioned in doubles. Maybe because they give you double time <laughs> on, on your forehead. But it's always stressed as if the Torah is saying, This one, my gosh, this one, don't let this one go. Give this one all you got. Not just give, give and give and give because it's giving you back more and more and more. It's doing more for you than you're doing for the person you're helping. It creates an etratzon. It's a midah keneged midah. You help the person that seek out your help. Hashem's going to help you when you seek out His help. You have the, the ot on your forehead an entire week. So you have a whole week of etratzon. You have a whole week of shmira. You have a week of tzedakat tatzil mimavet. I mean, it's unbelievable. And therefore Torah stresses, don't let this one go. And I was thinking to myself, what topic do we speak about this week? We're coming to Elul. What ticket do I want to walk into the month of Elul? I thought to myself, you know, let's pick a mitzvah and let's own it. Let's pick a mitzvah and let's walk in and say, Hashem, here, here's my trump card. You know, excuse me. Here is my card. <laughs> here's my trump card. I'm walking to Elul with male, male mitzvah tzedakah. And I want this, this sign on my forehead to shine, not just one week, the whole month. I want to shine in Elul. So that when I come to Yom Hadin and I stand in front of Hashem, Hashem says, oh, look at this guy. He's shining. I mean, wouldn't you want to shine on Yom Hadin? If there was ever a time that somebody would want to look good, right? He would want to look good in the eyes of the judge. This would be the time. And here's the recipe. It says the Arizal. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. Let's walk in, let's walk into Elul shining. Here's the recipe. Beautiful. And somehow, sometimes, when you hear the positive, you could also understand a little bit the negative. Till now we were talking so much about the beautiful Etratzon, and we'll we'll come back to this point in a moment at the end of the share. I want to get back to this as well. But we were speaking, speaking so much about how much the mitzvah of tzedakah specifically does for you in the long term. And how someone who does it cashes in big time. But then in the past we also spoke about how when someone held back from giving tzedakah, how it also in a certain way took away from that person chayim. Also took away from that person light also took away from that person a certain protection where he could have had the mitzvah to protect him and instead he didn't, held back the money, didn't give the mitzvah and took a terrible fall. If you remember that famous Gemara Bab Batra, we mentioned it in the past, I was believe it was the Gemara Repapa. 
same Gemara. That whole Gemara talks about Sedaka. And the Fyudam Ral for the Ambabatra. The Gemara tells us over there that Rapapa was going up a ladder. I know you've heard this from me in the past, but I just want to stress this point because I think it's fantastic. We're trying to prepare us for Elul. This is gold. Gold is going up. You know that. <laughs> okay, anyways. The Gemara tells us about Batra Yud, Dafyud Amur Aleph, that Rapapa was going up a ladder. And as he was ascending the ladder, one of the rungs, one of the steps on the ladder cracked, and Rapapa fell off the ladder. And kind of the Gemara does something very interesting. The Gemara kind of freezes Rapapa midair and kind of narr narrates what he was thinking at the time that he was falling. And the Gemara says that Rapapa says to himself as he's falling, what did I do? What could have I done? What avera did I do that this should happen to me that I should fall off the ladder? Did I, did, did I do something, God forbid, that was chayam skila? You see, because in the olden days, skila wasn't just that they actually stoned the person, but also we know there was a form of skila that they would throw him off a high building or a mountain and he would come hitting, instead of the rock hitting him, he would hit the rock. So he's falling. The rabbi is falling. Rapapa. They freeze him midair and he says to himself, did I do anything to deserve to fall to such a skila, to such a situation, such an onesh? What sin did I do? And it's very interesting. The Gemara tells us that sitting right there was Reb Chia Barav Midifte. Reb Chia Barav Midifte. Reb Chia Barav, who watched Reb Papa fall, he turns to Reb Papa and he tells him, you did not do anything that's chayav sekila, but you know why you're falling? Because you had an opportunity to give siddaka to an ani, and you held back. And someone who has the opportunity to give siddaka, and they hold back, God forbid, God forbid, it kind of causes its gorem, the person, to fall. Now think about this for a minute from what we just said moments ago. Think about this for a minute. If the giving of siddakah brings a shine to the person's face and creates an etratzon, that's what the Gemara we saw Daf Yud, Rebbe Azar, that after he gave siddakah to the Ani, he quickly went and started praying. That means that the siddakah elevated him. And if it elevated him, he took the opportunity to really reach high. Reach high to Shamayim with Tefillot. So now the opposite, it seems, that Reb Chia Bar Difti is telling Reb Papa, but if not only you didn't give, but you didn't give the Siddhaqah to the Ani, so not only doesn't it raise you up, it kind of brings you down to a fall. It creates a fall for a person. We have to be so careful with this mitzvah this week's parashah. It's unbelievable. We have to be so careful to walk around with those little dollar bills in the back pocket is, is, is important. The plan. You, you don't just walk out of the house and go to uh, Sichuel or Landau's. You know there are going to be people coming around. Give. Even if it's a quarter each person. Even if it's a dollar. But there should be nobody's hand that should walk away from us empty-handed. At least I didn't hold out, hold back on anyone. Everything. It's not about how much you gave. Of course, the more you give, the better. But you gave. You didn't send someone away empty-handed. You didn't hold out on them. You didn't hold back from them. Because, says Reb Chia Bar Difte, Reb Papa, when you hold back Siddhaqah from Ani, you fall. Now, where, where did he get this from? So, in the past, we've spoken about this magnificent Vilna Gaon. The Vilna Gaon on this week's parasha. Patoach tiftach et yadecha. Says the Gaon, you'll find this Gaon in the Pninim of the Shulchan, the Vilna Gaon, Parsha Re'e. The Gaon says, if you take a good look, what are the Ta'amim on the words, Patoach tiftach et yadecha lo? What's the Ta'amim? Says the Gaon, the Ta'amim, Darga Tevir. Darga means Madregot. Darga is a step. Tevir means milashon tavar, broken. Darga tevir, the broken step, meaning patoach tiftach et yadecha lo. 
Open your hand and give the Ani when he needs your help. Because if you don't open your hand, then God forbid, what will happen by holding back tzedakah? Darga tivir. The step will break underneath your foot, and has shalom, the person will come to a fall. And, and says the Gaon, this is where Reb Chia Bar Difte got his, his, his idea from. That was the heads up he was giving Reb Papa. He says, you know why the step of the ladder cracked underneath your foot? You know why you're falling? It must be, it must be that there was once a time that a poor man came to you, requested tzedakah, and you held back. Unbelievable. Now, Rabotai, we're going to find out tonight that this goes very deep, and there's such a powerful point here. It's something that we can learn even from the greatest of people. Greatest of people. There's a very famous Gemara on Shabbat. The Gemara on Daf Lamed Amud Aleph, turning on to Lamed Amud Bet. Gemara tells us something fantastic. Amar Rabbi Yehuda Amar Rav. My dichtiv, what does the Pasuk say in Tehillim when it says, Hodieni Hashem Kitsi. David HaMelech asked Hashem, Please reveal to me the day I'm going to die. I want to prepare. I want to know the day you're coming to take me out of this world. Now, David HaMelech, it's very interesting. We know the entire saga. We've spoken about this many times in the past. Where David HaMelech really, really got his life, his years from Adam HaDishon. And we're going to speak about this in a moment a little bit deeper when it comes to the further episode that this Gemara is going to highlight. Listen to this. But David HaMelech, his 70 years that he got, he got as a present, Adam HaDishon. Actually, when it came down to the due date, Adam Arishon says the Midrash wanted to take the years back. It's what's called an Indian giver. You know, he he said <laughs> he said he was going to give, but when it came time to Levisa, he took the present. He, wa he wanted to take the present back. Hashem, Bore Olam, who understands man and understands how sometimes we're very generous, but then when it comes down to the moment, some people get second thoughts, cold feet. So it came to, you know, Adam HaRishon was supposed to live a thousand years. It came to year 930. 930. I believe that's the time right now. It came to the year 930. And sure enough, Adam started saying, wait, you know what? I still want to live. I want to do more. I want my years back. I had second thoughts. I changed my mind, Rabbi. I'm sorry. I wanted to give you the donation, but now I... Uh, that's why David Amel said, Al tiv techu bindi bim, beben adam she'en lo teshua. Do not put your trust nor depend on the philanthropy, on the benefactors of man. One day they'll tell you they'll give, and the next day they're taking it back. Al tiv techu bindi bim. Oh boy, is this a musar. Don't put your trust in people. Beben Adam Shemot Yeshuvah. That says David HaMelech, look, Adam HaRishon, he, he, uh, he put up 70 years for me. And now when it came down, to the, came down to the wire, came down to the moment, he took back his donation. He canceled his donation. Unbelievable. Tetzei Rucho Yashuv La'admato. Because when it comes time for his Ruach to leave him, Yashuv La'admato, and he's going to go back to the ground, at that day, he loses all his ethics. He forgets everything that he promised. That it, uh, you promised it to me in the day of your death, you pulled it back. On that day, that's why David Amel says, Ashrei. El Yaakov be Israel, right? Ashrei, right? Elohei Yaakov. Tetzei Rucho Yashuv Lamato Bayom Ahu Avdu Mashotav Ashrei She'el Yaakov be Israel. Ashrei, praiseworthy is El Yaakov be Israel. Yaakov Avinu was Titen Emet Li Yaakov. The people that hold to their word. Ashrei She'el Yaakov be Israel, says David. Praiseworthy are the people that when they say they're going to give, they stick to it and they give. They don't pull it back at the last second. 
when 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 it's time to uh amazing anyways so david amelech comes to hashem the gemara on shabbat of lamana muralaf and he says to hashem let me know i want to know the day i'm going to pass away and bore olam tells him i'm sorry uh, company policy, we do not reveal that information to anybody. He says, Bore Olam told him, he says that I do not reveal to anyone the day of their demise. So David Amelech says, if that's the case, please, Bore Olam, at least, if you're not going to tell me when I'm going to die, could you at least tell me what day of the week? And Hashem says, I'll tell you. You're going to die, David, on the seventh day of the week, on Shabbat. David Amel says, Shabbat? But then they're not going to be mitapel with my body, kvura. I'm going to have to wait till Sunday to, to be buried. Says, Borei Olam, Shabbat. No, please, Borei Olam, let me be, give me one more day. One more day. Like this, they'll be able to bury me on the, on the, on the very day. My, my body will not have to wait overnight. Bury me on, uh, let me take me on Sunday. He says, Bore Olam, I can't. Give you a chal. He says, I can't. Because it's already examined a shamayim that Shilomo's kingdom is going to start on Sunday. Ve'en malchut nogat be malchut bechaverta afilu bilmele nima. That one malchut will not overlap the era of the next malchut, not even a hair's breadth. And because Shalomo already is destined to start to rule that day, I cannot allow you to live an extra day. So David Amalek says, so if that's the case, please, then you know what? Let me live a day less. Let me piss away on Friday. And like this, they'll bury me on Friday, Erev Shabbat. Says Borei Olam, what? Friday? You mean you want to hold back from me one day of the life of David Amalek? Do you know how much I enjoy your learning, says Borei Olam? Says Borei Olam, one day of David's learning is like a thousand korbanot of Shlomo. He says, I enjoy your learning more than thousands of korbanot of your son Shlomo. I'm not ready to be mevater on your one day of learning. Where do we say that? We say it. Every time we say the beginning of Says Hashem, one day of your learning, David, is more special to me than Elif. Alef, a thousand korbanot to Shlomo. I'm not ready to be mevater on one day of your learning. It's more special to me than a thousand korbanot. That should teach you something, Rabbi what Torah is. We have no idea. We have no clue what Torah is. We have no clue what Talmidei Chachamim are. We have no clue the, the, the greatness of Limud Torah. Hashem says, no dice. You will pass away on Shabbat. David said, okay. So what did David do? So we all know the famous Gemara on Shabbat. David went out of his way to beat the system. He came up with a brilliant idea because he understood that as long as he's learning Torah, he's immortal. Malchamavit can't touch him because as long as he's learning Torah, he is Osek in the mitzvah, the greatest of all mitzvot. He can't be an anizakin, like we said before by Siddhaka. And if that's the case, every Shabbat, David Amelech would learn the entire Shabbat from beginning to end. He would do Steigen 25 hours Shabbat. When did he pray? When did he eat? I'm not sure. But the Gemara says he learned the entire Shabbat. And every Shabbat, David HaMelech, when it would come time for Shabbat to be over, he would celebrate. And that's the Mlava Malka. That's why it's called Su'udat Revi'it, Su'udat David HaMelech. Because it was a celebration. For all I know, this Shabbat, the Malach HaMavit came to get me, says David, and I beat him, and he can't touch me. I beat the system because I was learning Torah. I'm untouchable. Su'udat Mlava Malka was a feast. By the way, the minhag that people have, that we laugh by Havdalah, according to many, comes from David HaMelech, comes from this story. 
because when it came time to make Havdalah and Shabbat was over, David HaMelech said, the Borei Priyagav, he started to live hysterically. I beat him. I beat the system. I beat the Malach HaMavet. Can't touch me. <laughs> I was laughing. He was laughing. Some people have the minhag to laugh, not by the Borei Priyagav, but by the Borei Meore Ha'esh. But that comes from the Me'iri. The Me'iri writes that when Adam HaRishon did the sin, Adam HaRishon, it was a few hours before Shabbat, he did the terrible Avera, suddenly the world started getting dark, he thought he was going to die. He didn't understand the concept because he was only created that day. Suddenly the world gets dark, Shabbat comes upon him, it was dark, he was scared. His body went into a metamorphosis, he switched over from what he once was to what he became. He went from caterpillar to butterfly, where his entire body originally when he was created was made out of the substance that we call our fingernails. But that was his entire body. And that's why Adam and Rishon was Mavrik. When the sun would shine on Adam and Rishon, he would shine up the whole world because he had that uh, very shiny, glossy type of a texture all over him. Amazing. But then when he did the sin, he went back into the ground and his body became this putty, skin-like type of form that we have till today, only leaving a very tiny bit of nail bed, what we call today the fingernails. And when it came, Shabbat was over, and Adam Arishon looks at this new body, this metamorphosis that he has now after the sin. He looks down on his fingernails, and it reminds him of what he once looked like. And the reason why Hashem put these fingernails where they are was to remind him that there's teshuva, that you can still, there's still, there's still a little petach. You can still go back. You can still fix what you messed up. And therefore, Motzei Shabbat, when Adam Arishon still was figuring out his new form after he did the sin, and he struck that first rock with the stick or two sticks or however he came to that first invention or realization of fire. At the moment that he struck that first fire and he looked at his new form, his new body, he looked down at his fingernails into the fire and he said, oh, I still have a little, little bit left of what I once was. Hashem is showing me a sign that I still have a petach of teshuvah, I can go back and still be what I once was. I can still be mavrik, I can still go back, do teshuvah, and still get forgiveness to light up the world again, like I once lit, like I once shone over the entire world. So when he looked at his fingers in the light, in the fire, he started to laugh. That's why Moshe Shabbat, what do we do? We look at our, we take the, the boreme oreha esh, and we look at our fingernails. We are literally mimicking Adam Arishon. And just like Adam laughed at that moment, realizing that there's still a petach of teshuvah, many people have the minhag at that point of Havdalah, not by the Geffen, but at that point of the Havdalah, by the Borei Morei Ha'esh, to laugh. And now coming to Elul, it's a good reminder that we still have a petach of teshuvah. We could always go back. And Hashem will always accept us back. Go back and do teshuvah. Go back and be who you know you're supposed to be. Not what we evolved in becoming through the Averot of society. What a message. But David HaMelech at this point was on a high. Shabbat after Shabbat, he was learning Torah the entire Shabbat. And when it came time, he left. He made the celebration, the feast, Sudat Revit. Sudat David HaMelech. Until finally, like the Gemara on Shabbat, Lamud Amud Bet, tells us the end of the story. The Malachamavet shows up on that destined Shabbat. The Shabbat that David Amelech was meant to be taken. And the Malachamavet comes to David, and David is steiging and learning. And he's untouchable. You can't touch him. A guy that sits and learns Torah, the world can't lay a finger on him. Angels, demons, all of the terrible, whatever it is that's bad 
in this world or the next, he's untouchable. He's learning Torah. And as long as he's learning Torah, he's holding God's hand. He's untouchable. So what did the Malach HaMavid do? So the Gemara narrates, and the Gemara says that the Malach HaMavid came and Velo Yacholo, he could not take David. So he's trying to figure out, how is he going to do his job? He was supposed to take him this Shabbat. So says the Gemara, the Malach HaMavid went behind the castle and he found these great large trees and he started to shake and bang the trees into each other like a tornado. And it made such a loud rash, such a major loud sound that it stopped David for one second. David for one second stopped learning. What is that? And he got up from the Gemara and he ran up the stairs to look out the window to see what's going on in the back. And as he ran up those stairs, says the Gemara, Ifchit darga mitute, the steps cracked underneath his feet and he fell. Venach nafshe, and at that moment, David Amelech died. That was the moment that the Malchamavit took him. It's amazing, the Malchamavit could have made any decoy, any distraction, any ra'ash in the back of the castle. But Chazal tell us something brilliant. We know that David HaMelech was a Gilgul of Adam HaRishon. And that's why Adam gave David the 70 years. Because in essence, really, Adam took the 70 years out of one pocket and put it in the other pocket. Because he really gave it to himself. Because David was here to fix Adam HaRishon. David was supposed to pass away as a little baby after three hours after he was birth, given birth. Because those were the three hours that Adam Arishon sinned. So he was supposed to be mechaper for Adam Arishon and die after those three hours. You see, Adam Arishon was created. And within the three hours that he was created on Friday afternoon, he sinned. And he was not killed. Although Hashem said that the moment you eat from that etzadat, you're going to die. And he didn't die. So who's going to take the bullet for Adam Arishon, who was supposed to die after three hours and didn't die after three hours? David HaMelech. David HaMelech, who was the Gilgul of Adam Arishon, he was born and he was supposed to die after three hours. He was going to take the bullet for Adam Arishon. And Adam Arishon saw in the future that this great Sadiq was going to be born and die after three hours because of him, because of his sin. This little baby's taking his bullet. Adam felt bad. So Adam said, you know what, Borei Olam, wait. I'll give him 70 years of my life. Because he's dying because of me. At least let him live. So Adam Arishon gave him the 70 years. Malach Hamavet knew that Adam Arishon, David was the Gilgul of Adam Arishon. The word Adam stands for Aleph Adam. Dalit David, Mem Mashiach. It's all one person, one Gilgul. Well, maybe one day we'll talk about that. that, that that's a big share, for, not, not for tonight. But Malachamavet knew that Adam, David was a Gilgul of Adam Arishon. How did the Malachamavet bring down Adam Arishon? Through the trees. So now, how is he going to bring down the Gilgul of Adam Arishon, Ad David Amelech? Through the trees. He went back to the Etz Adat and shook the tree, meaning he shook the original Avera of Adam Arishon, the trees, in order to destroy Adam Arishon, round two, a.k.a. David Amelech. Amazing. Wow, what a shot. And that's the way he got him. So, but wait one second, wait one second. How did David die? Now, it's interesting. All the Gemara had to say was that David stopped learning. That's all I had to say. And at the moment David stopped learning, the Malach HaMavit came and boom, took him. Gemara doesn't do that. The Gemara goes into specific detail of how David died. The Gemara doesn't tell us detail for naught. Every letter, every, every detail in the Gemara is thought out with genius. Says the Gemara, David stopped learning. He got up, he walked up the steps to look out the window and the steps cracked underneath his feet and he fell to his death. Why all the detail? Why the need? Because the Gemara is teaching us something. 
the Vilna Gaon that we just mentioned. Patoach tiftach et yadichalo. What are the tamim? Darga tevir. If you don't open your hand and you don't give the tzedakah, the steps will crack underneath you. That's what Rechia Bardifte told Repapa when the step cracked on the ladder and he was falling. Wait one second. But what that means, that David HaMelech, he walked up the steps and the steps cracked underneath him and he fell to his death. Does that mean that there was a time in the life of David HaMelech that he wasn't patoach tiftach lo? And because of that, the way that Malach HaMavit decided to take him or was able to take him was dargat tevir, the steps cracking underneath, and for him to fall and die? And the answer is yes. And this is brilliant. This is the cheshbon of the great Rabbi Yonatan Ipshitz. This is one of my favorite Rabbi Yonatan Ipshitz. I've said this in the past, but it just gets better. It's like a, it's like a good wine. It just gets better with age. The Rabbi Yonatan Ipshitz is found in Yarod Vash in Darush Bet, pages Mem Bet through Mem Gimel. Again, I attribute this beautiful Mar Makom to my Yedid Nefesh, Rabbi Gladstein, Hashem should bless him, Arichut Yami Vishani. But open your hearts, you have to hear this. David HaMelech had a passion like nobody else. He had on his bucket list, now, if you want to talk about bucket lists, I, 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 I'm a little bit embarrassed to tell you when I was young what my bucket list was. I'm embarrassed. We were all young and foolish. You know, when I was young, I had this crazy thing. I mean, I had this whole bucket list. I'm not going to go into the whole thing. But just as an example, one of the things I had in my head, I don't know why, I had this infatuation that I wanted to swim with dolphins. I don't know. So one time, you know, years ago, me and my wife, we went out to San Francisco. We went there for like a week on vacation just to get away from it all. And we went to SeaWorld. And I couldn't believe it. They actually had a package there swimming with dolphins. And I turned to my wife and I said, it's crazy expensive, but it's my bucket list, you know. And she said, oh, it's your bucket list. So like, you know, how could I? And sure enough, they took me into a room with a few people and they gave me a wetsuit. Good luck trying to get that suit on. I couldn't get the zip anyways. And I jumped into the water, and I we have videos of swimming with dolphins. And to me, it was it sounds ridiculous, I know, and it's not something that you share live. But you know what? David Amelech had a real bucket list. And I used my petty example to be able to dramatize his great example. Because I'll take the bullet for David Amelech any day of the week. David HaMelech, the top of his bucket list. He wanted more than anything in the world. Please, Hashem, let me be the one to build the Bet HaMikdash. David HaMelech. He wanted more than anything to build that Bet HaMikdash. It was his life's passion. It was his greatest, greatest, greatest passion. And Hashem says to David HaMelech, David, I'm sorry. I know how much you want to build the Bet HaMikdash, but I cannot allow it. Why? Because there are blood on your hands. You know, I read this pasuk, I can cry. Vayihi, I mean, David HaMelech went through so much. Vayihi alai dvar Hashem lemor. Hashem says to David, this is in Devrei HaYamim, Chav Bet Chet, Larov shafachta, you spilled so much blood, you fought in so many wars. David HaMelech was the most awesome of warrior, warriors. If you see what the Midrashim writes, he was unbelievable. With one swoop, he took off a thousand heads of Pilishtim with one swing of the sword. Wow. Nonetheless, dam larov shafachta milchamot asita, because he did so many wars. So much blood's on your hand, David. Lo tivned bayit lishmi. I can't allow you to build a bet hamikdash for me. Ki damim rabim shafachta art zalefanai. You spilled so much blood. You have blood on your hands. 
Now I'll tell you the truth. Ask Rabbi Yonah to my trips, and this is something that always bothered me. What type of blood are we talking about? I mean, these, these milchamot were milchamat, milchamet mitzvah. These were milchamet mitzvah. He went out to fight Laman Hashem, Laman Klal Yisrael. David HaMelech. I mean, so the blood was blood of mitzvah. You're going to hold that against him? Can you imagine Hashem comes to a mohel? He says, listen, you're the best mohel in town. You'll see the olam haba I have waiting for you. You're not going to imagine. Ayin lorata. Oh! But Bet HaMikdash, you can't build. Sorry, Mr. Mohel. Because you know what? There's blood on your hands. Could that, would that make sense to anybody? It's a blood of mitzvah. It's a dumb mitzvah. Hashem goes to a shochet. You have blood on your hands. But, but because of my shechitan, they were able to eat. It's kasher, kashrut, mitzvah. What's the pshat that Hashem told David? There's dam on your hands. Milchamot. Milchamet mitzvah. It's just the opposite. Anyone that learned Mesechet Berachot, you remember that the Gemara praises David HaMelech that in spite of the fact that he's a king, he didn't hold himself too high, but he would actually paskin the laws of Nida and Dam day and night to bring wives back to their husbands. Bitahara. The Gemara describes it that David was up until his arms, into his elbows in blood. And the Gemara was, was, was praising him for it. Praising him. Then instead of, oh, I'm the king, I'm, I'm going to paskin on petty... No, to David, he, day and night, he was working to get as many clean situations so that husband and wife will be happy. And yet over here, it's held against him. What's Pshat? Ah, yeah, 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 open your hearts. Says the great Yarod Vash, Yavyonatan Aipshitz, brilliant of brilliant. He says, I want to tell you a story, a story that they didn't tell us in Yeshiva. Says Rabbi Yonatan Aipshitz, when David HaMelech was a young boy, some say he was seven, some say he was nine, twelve, fourteen. But that was that amazing, great and fateful day. That Goliath was on the battlefield taunting Klal Yisrael. And Shaul HaMelech turned and said, anyone that can take down the giant. He gave him tremendous incentives and rewards. His daughter, I mean, unbelievable things. A young boy steps up, a redhead, <laughs> by the name of David. And he says that he's going to fight the Muhammad Hashem. They tried to put his armor on him. The armor of Shaul. Shaul was incredibly tall. How are you going to fit the armor on this little boy? According to one Midrash, it actually was a nest that it shrunk down to his size. But according to another uh, Midrash, is that Bechlal was a schok. It was a so David walked with no armor, as we know. He walked out into the battlefield with a, as we've told, with a slingshot, with just one rock or a few rocks. And it was over there that Goliath began to laugh. This is who you send out. And David slings the rock. And either the metal of his helmet opened up right by his temple and received the rock, a ness. Or David was so incredibly good at the swinging of that rock that he was able to place the rock right at the spot where the helmet ended and showed some skin by the temple of the head of Goliath. But the bottom line is he connected and he brought down the giant. He brought down the giant. And it was there that David went and unsheathed the sword from his sheath and brought it down on his head and decapitated him. And that was the moment that Klal Yisrael celebrated. How do you celebrate a moment like that with a war hero of such magnitude? In the olden days, what they used to do to war heroes was that when they would come back from war on that ticker day parade, they would throw all their gold and silver and jewelry on top of the hero. This was accustomed. According to many Midrashim, that's what happened by Yosef at Sadiq, because Yosef saved the entire Egypt. So he was considered, you know, the savior of Egypt, so to speak. So they, they, Banot Sada Aleshur, that they would, says Rashi, they threw all their jewelry on top of him. 
He's the guy. He's the guy who saved Egypt. He saved, he saved the world. So too David HaMelech. He was the war hero. So they threw all types of jewelry and gold and silver. They threw everything on top of him. He was the youngest multi-billionaire in history. David HaMelech. Young, young little boy with mounds, mounds of gold and silver and jewelry and diamonds. What did young David do? He took all the money, all the precious stones, all the gold and silver, and he consecrated it. He was makdishit to the future building of the Ben Damikdash. He says, David, I want this so much that I'm going to be my own in-house funder. I'm not going to have to come on to anyone else asking for favors and building appeals and building funds and, 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 and no, no. I'm going to do this berachvut. I'm going to do this bechavod. I'm going to do this with style. I want this so much. And I want it to be me. So he took every dollar and he put it in storage houses and storage houses. He filled up storage houses with gold and silver and diamonds, all consecrated to the future building of the Beit HaMikdash. And then one day, actually, more correct. And then one morning, early morning, says David Amelech was the first one to have that provincial uh, biblical alarm clock. Says David took his harp and put it on the window, and the wind would come blowing in. The wind, the northern wind, would come blowing in, and it would start to play a magnificent tune on the chords of the harp, and that would wake up David. By Hatzot, Hatzot Laila, Akum Lahodot. David would wake up every night by Hatzot. He would only sleep 70 Nishimot, 30 Nishimot, depending on which Gemara you learn. But he slept just a drop. Just a drop. And then David would get up with such fire, with such a drive, and he would learn Torah all night. And he would be Mechaber, the book of Tehillim. And every word of Tehillim is Ruach HaKodesh. And it came from those lofty nights. Hatzot Laila Akum Lahodot. This was the night that all Shirot Tishbachot came from those nights. Amazing. And when it came early morning, one morning, says the Gemara, the rabbis came into the inner chamber of David HaMelech. And the rabbis said to David, David, you have to help us. The kingdom, the people, Klal Yisrael, they're starving. There's such poverty amongst the people. Please, we need a stimulus plan. We need a... The one guy just told me, Rabbi, I just got BBB. <laughs> no, no, it's PPP. <laughs> I just got the PPP loan. <laughs> I just got, the, I'm starting to sound like my brother Ari. It's, I just got the PPP loan. I'm so excited. He says, David, we need a stimulus plan. We need a plan to save the people. Such poverty. And David Amelech said, go out and make an announcement that Klal Yisrael should only give the business between one and another. And like this, it'll raise up the industry, the economy, no matter if some goy is cheaper, but you give the business to a Jew. And this should be a life lesson regardless. You give the business to a Yid. You give the business to a Jew. Hashem will pay you back. You're helping out my kid more than the Amamim. Help him. You see your brother, Kiyamuch Achicha. You see your brother is down and out. For a few pennies, you're going to give it away to somebody else. Go out and make that industry work amongst the people. Give each other business. The rabbi said, David, the situation is so bad, my king. It's so bad that not even that will work. We hit a point where the example they gave him was that when you dig a hole in the ground, and then you try to fill that hole back up with its own dirt. It never completely fills the hole properly. Meaning, there's not enough money to go around. Even if we try to fill our own holes with our own money, it won't fill the hole completely. We still need a stimulus plan. We need help. 
David thought and David told them what they did not expect. They expected David to turn around and say, if that's the case, take my money. I'll forego my dream for the Bet HaMikdash. And I know what you're thinking. What do you mean? He made it Hegdesh. It was consecrated. But this was Pikuach Nefesh. Pikuach Nefesh is Doche, even the building of Bet HaMikdash. Even the building of Bet HaMikdash. Ashir Torah is Doche, the building of Bet HaMikdash, the Gemara says. They couldn't learn. It was poverty. So let alone the amount of learning that would have been gained, let alone the amount of help that Klal Yisrael would have been saved. Pikuach Nefesh is Doche, the building Bet HaMikdash. They were hinting, David, we need your money. <coughs> and David HaMelech, he was so bent on wanting that dream, that passion, that bucket list. To want to be the one to be Zochet, to build the Bet HaMikdash. I want to build Hashem's house. He didn't give the money. He held it back. And instead, he told the Rabbanim, if that's the case, then go out to war. Go out to war. Not Milchemet Mitzvah. Milchemet Rishut. Go out to a Milchemet Rishut and conquer other nearby countries. And the taxes and the booty that comes back from war, that will fill the hole and that will save the Jewish people. But David, war is blood. War is war. War is Gehenam. And if that's the case, people are going to die. For what? For the sake of just bringing a better financial situation? Give the money. No. And he sent them out to war. Says Hashem, David, not the milchamot of mitzvah. No, 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 no. no. But the milchamot that you sent them out because you held back the tzedakah from Klal Yisrael their blood is on your hands. That blood disqualified you from building the Bet HaMikdash. So the very reason why you are holding back the money, thinking that that's going to be your ticket to build the Bet HaMikdash, was the very thing that got you disqualified from building the Bet HaMikdash. That's what it means. Damim Rabim Shafachta. Milchamot Asita. Why did you make Milchamot? Why did you hold back your money? You should have given it to the people. They were starving. And because of that, Darga Tevir, says Rabbi Yonatan Eibshitz, someone who's not patoach tiftach et yadichalo, someone who doesn't give the money to the Ani at the time that they need it desperately, and they have good cheshbonot, but they held it back. At the end, Darga Tevir. And that's what happened to the great David HaMelech. How did the Malach take him? The Gemara goes out of its way to say, not just that he stopped learning. No, he ran up the stairs. Ifchit darga mitute. And the stairs cracked underneath his feet. And that's the way he was taken. Why? Darga tevir. Because here's the moment of patoach tiftach. And in order to build the Bet HaMikdash, in order to do great things, it starts with giving Siddhaka. And if David would have given the tzedakah, he would have built the Bet HaMikdash. So says Rabbi Yonatan Eibshitz. And he says, I'll prove it to you. If you take a look at the end in Melachim Aleph, when it's time that King Shlomo ends up building Bet HaMikdash, you need to hear what happened there. This is an amazing thing. Listen to this. Vatishlam kol ha says the Pasuk. And they finish the entire Melacha of the building of the Bet HaMikdash. Who made it? Who built the Bet HaMikdash? Asher Asa HaMelech Shalomo. Bet Hashem. Shalomo is the one who built the Bet HaMikdash. But what happened? Listen to this now. The Pasuk doesn't end there. Says the Pasuk, when Shlomo built the Bet HaMikdash, you know what he did? Right when he built it? Vayave Shalomo et Kodshe David Aviv. He opened up his father's storage houses of all the money. All the Kodshe David, all the money that David consecrated to build Bet HaMikdash. Et HaKesef, Bet HaZahav, Bet HaKelim, all the riches and all the gold and the silver. 
and all the jewelry that was thrown at him on that day when he was a young boy and he consecrated it to the Bet HaMikdash and he placed it in storage houses. Natan Ba'otzarot Bet Hashem that he put into the Otzarot to be for the Bet Hashem that my father consecrated all of that wealth to one day be Zochet to build the Bet HaMikdash. And he was not Zochet to build the Bet HaMikdash. Shalomo built it with Klal Yisrael and they didn't even use David's money. After all that, after all that, and the money wasn't even used, Hashem says, that money should have gone to the Anim. And if you didn't give it to the Anim, I don't want it. I don't want it. That's not, that's not money that was held back from Siddhaka. Giving is not the money that builds Bet HaMikdash. Shalomo builds the Bet HaMikdash with the people and with the Trumot of Am Yisrael. So what happened to the money of David? Says the Radak over there on the Pasuk, Melachim Aleph. Unbelievable Radak. We're looking at Perek Zayin. Pasuk Nun Aleph. Says the Radak, Amar Shalomo. Said Shalomo to himself after he built the Bet HaMikdash. Ra'av haya bime Abba. There was a famine at the time when my father was king, Shalosh Shanim. It was shlo, Shalosh Shanim Shana. It was two, three years long. Achre Shenat Vahayalo Levazvez Akdashot Ha'ele Lahayot Pahem Aniye Israel. And my father was supposed to give out all the money in the storage houses. Instead of put away to the Bet HaMikdash, he was supposed to give it to the poor people of Klal Yisrael just to keep them alive. And he didn't. It says Shlomo, if that's the case, I'm going to do it now. Shlomo opens up all the storage houses after the Bet HaMikdash was built with other monies and he gives his father monies out to all the Aniim of Klal Yisrael to give David HaMelech the Tikkun, that finally all that money made it to the mark that it was supposed to go, to the Aniim of the Jewish people. And this is the, you know, you know it's amazing, David HaMelech knew this. The Pasuk says, Im amarti mataragli hastecha Hashem yisadeni. Please Hashem, you be the support under my feet. He realized later on that he was supposed to give and he didn't. And therefore he knew that the ground underneath his feet was cracking. Im amarti mataragli. Hashem yisadeni. Maybe the chesed of God would support under my feet that I don't take a fall because I understand that I got to there. Unbelievable, unbelievable, unbelievable. This is too much. This is too much. Ah, thank you, Rabbi Gladstein for being more me on this unbelievable piece, this Rabbi Yonatan Eipschitz, unbelievable. Ah, I could say this piece again and again and just enjoy it like a good wine. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. We're coming into Elul. And if there was ever a time that we needed et ratzon, after the year that we're coming from, it's now. How do you get et ratzon? You need a big, big zechut. We need our faces to shine. Tzedakah, the Arizal taught us in the beginning of this class that all of the mitzvot, the letter shines on your face for a day. Not tzedakah. It's for tzedkato, omedet la'ad. It shines long time. Let's go into the month of Elul with our faces shining the entire month. Al Yideh, the tremendous tzedakah that we're going to give. But not just that. So that when we come into Yom Adin, we come in with a zechut. We come in with something in our hands, something to represent us. Could you imagine a guy who has all types of accounts, all types of charges against him, and he comes into the high court, and he doesn't even show up with a lawyer. They look at this guy and they, chutzpah, you guy. Chutzpah. If you didn't even hire a lawyer, that means you're in absolute denial that you ever did anything wrong because like, like the guy, I have nothing to defend. 
I have nothing to defend. And they look at the guy even worse. You chutzpah you. You don't even think you have what to defend. What? You don't even think you did anything wrong. You're walking in heke. Like, you know, happy holiday. Happy holiday. Yeah, Roshana, Happy holiday. That's what you're doing from Yom Adin. You're making it happy holiday. Do you know what's on the line? After we live through this year, don't we understand how much weight a Rosh Hashanah carries? And now's the prep. Elul is here. Why is the month of Av called Av? Because Aleph Bet stands for Elul Ba. This month, your head is supposed to be thinking on Elul coming at me. I got to get ready. So I'm a week away, not even a few days away. Shabbat Mevarchim. Say the Tehilim on Shabbat. So that we'll have a great month. And when you come into the Elul, at least I'm going to come with a lawyer to court. The finest lawyers are the lawyers that make us look good. Tzedakah makes our faces shine more than all other mitzvot. V'sidkato omedet la'ad, said the Arizal. Not for one day, for a whole week. For a whole month. We need major tzedakah zechut. I want to close with this. So there I am at my consuegros Pidyon Ben. Great people. Morris Mizrahi and his wife Vivian. Shem shall bless them, really. Such good people. And, you know, their son Henry, my, my son-in-law's brother, was making Pidyon Aben for this little baby Moshe. And the five coins by Rabbi Dweck was already done through the transaction of Pidyon Aben. And now these coins are coins of mitzvah. So the community, we have this beautiful minhag that we sell them. People want the zechut to have the coin of mitzvah. So they sell one coin and another coin, and then Morris, my consuegro, he turns to me and says, Rabbi, I want to give you one coin. Ah, God bless you. I want to give you one coin. Here, take a coin for your tzedakah. I took the coin. I stood up and I said, ladies and gentlemen, this summer, many of our good families from this wonderful, wonderful community of ours were supposed to go to Israel to make bar mitzvah. And you know what happened? But before I tell you, part of the bar mitzvah schedule, something beautiful that so many people are acquainted, are accustomed to do, is that when they're in Israel, not only do they make the bar mitzvah for their own kid, but they make the bar mitzvah for orphans together with their own son, like this one big beautiful party. And they make bar mitzvahs for all different type of orphan boys who don't have a father. They buy them the tefillin, they buy them a beautiful suit, they make a beautiful party, they... Their friends come, their family comes. It's this big, beautiful bar mitzvah. Bunch of families together. The orphan boys with our boys and they all dance in the same circle. It's, it's gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Something to remember. Something. What a, what a, what a chesed. What a tzedakah. What a tzedakah. You make the life of this boy. He puts on tefillin for the rest of his life and he thinks about you. I told the crowd, I said, listen, but now because of COVID-19, all the bar mitzvahs were can canceled. And these boys are heartbroken. They have nobody. And I told them tonight, we can be the father of these boys. Avi tomin v'dayan amanot. That's what God calls himself. We, we, can, we can share that thunder a little bit. Well, you can be the father of this boy. I said, for $1,200. We can get him a pair of tefillin, make a party, give him a new suit, and give him a life. We miss him in the middle of Corona. I said, please, you know, there's 10 of these boys. I'm collecting for them. You don't know what happened. <laughs> you don't know what happened. You have no idea what happened. You know, the bids started at, I don't want to say numbers online, but I'm telling you, it was Wow. There's nobody out there like our community. I, I, it's, it's not normal. Really, it's unreal. Ashrechem Yisrael. Ashrechem. 
one guy had five thousand, ten thousand. Well, 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 they were going at it. That they, they were, you know, son-in-laws and father-in-laws were outbidding each other. And then this guy came up with his father-in-law, and this guy came up with his brother, and these two partners, and they're fighting. The numbers are going up, and I'm going. <laughs> I was like, wow, unbelievable. I thought, you know, it's unbelievable. They felt it. These guys are going to walk into your madin. And on their forehead, there's going to be the face of an orphan. And when God looks at them, he's going to see the face of that orphan in Israel that they bought a pair of tefillin for. And I want to tell you something. One guy could win because that's what an auction is. And one guy won. And he paid for the entire and more. But listen to how beautiful our people are. When we were done, after that, all these guys come running up to me. Rabbi, I didn't win the coin. But I want to be a part of this. I want tzedakah. I want the zechut. So we started finding more boys. And then if you heard my Tisha B'Av speech, the night of Tisha B'Av, we started on top of that a new program. For all the kids that were stuck at home in Corona, no camp can't leave, Israel has a second spike, locked at home with the widows, with no father. We hired secretaries and they're calling up hundreds of widows and orphans asking, what can we get for your kids to make life easier? One little girl, I have all the, doc all the conversations documented. Some of them I said the night at Tisha B'Av. One little girl says she wants a dress for Shabbat that she doesn't have to share with all her sisters because every ounce of clothing she has, she has to share with everybody. One little boy wanted a, you know, a little pool in his backyard because there's no camp. You know, the big plastic pools from Toys R Us. Aliyah <laughs> Shalom. You know what I'm saying. One guy wanted a guitar. Another guy wanted Svarim for Yeshiva for the coming Zman because he, he didn't have money to buy books. He didn't have money to buy a Gemara. You're talking about orphans. They have nothing. Israel already... The poverty that's going on now because of Corona is beyond. Could you imagine the ones that were already behind the eight ball before Corona? Where they are today? Not just financially, mentally. We're being misamech hundreds of orphans. There's, a, there's an organization, Yad Eliezer, I work with them all year to be misamech. All these almanot, they have 800 families of almanot. Let's take an almana with us into Yom Adin. There you'll talk about tzedakah. Walk in, let her be your attorney. Let her be the defense attorney to represent you. Then you'll have the tzedakah on your head, you'll be shining. And don't just give her one time. We have almanot. They can't make it, they need someone to put in the, the gap. So they need $400 a month, $500 a month. God bless the people in our community. We have people now stepping up. They're taking on an almana a month. This is my almana with my family. This is the almana. I know her life story. I know everything about what happened with her husband, how he passed away. These are the kids. I know what yeshivot they go to. They give them all the details of everything about the almana you're supporting. Where she lives, what's her name, where's the kids, what schools, and everything. And every month, you are helping her survive. You are supporting an almana and yitomim in Israel month by month by month. $400, $500 a month. You spend more on Starbucks. We can take that, pick up an almana, put her on our shoulder, and walk into Yom Adin and say, Judge me! Look at the way I'm shining. Look at the letter I have on my... Visid kato omedet laad. 732-520-0557. Thank you for listening.